Welcome. Welcome to more Congressional Elections. Last week we spent a little bit of time, or we spent a lot of time, talking about the redistricting effect and how that narrows our choices sometimes before the candidates even get out there. So this week we want to take a look at some different things. Look at it more from the candidate's perspective in terms of how do I, as a candidate, run a campaign strategy? What are my resources? Um, what are my chances as an incumbent? And we also take a look at the voters just a little bit. How do voters decide how to vote uh, for a particular candidate? So let's get started. There's a number of strategic variables that are common to all elections, whether they're U.S. Senate, U.S. Co US House, presidential, whatever. And as your book points out in Chapter 4, the first thing you want to think about is what is the nature of your constituency? And who are you trying to appeal to, in other words? That's who that will be. Um, is it several acres of urban slum? Or is it 30,000 acres of open prairie? So who are the people you're trying to reach? What is the particular office being sought? Are you seeking to run for the US House or the US Senate, at least in this context? This is going to determine the nature of the campaign and the themes that you stress. So as your book states, running for the United States Senate requires a very different strategy from that of trying to win a House seat. Another thing to consider is the nature of the electoral system. And in that sense, we mean, is it partisan or nonpartisan? To be more specific, is this a particular, is this a primary election that you're trying to campaign in? Or is this a general election? And if it is a general election, how many months after the primary is it? Is it two months after or six months after? So that's another thing that they're going to have to consider. We won't talk about all of these, but these are just different things that are common to all elections. What are the skills of the candidates? Um, David and Ed all talk about the skills of the candidates uh, in their example that they use at the very beginning of Chapter 4. They talk about you know, a candidate who is much more personable and down to earth, uh, more at ease talking to people one on one. Uh, another type of candidate who might be more formal, who is not at ease in the town hall style meeting, but is more comfortable behind a podium giving speeches. So you have to take a look at the skill of the candidate and what's going to be needed. Uh, what is the party organization in the constituency? So you look around, even when running for the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, is what kind of resources can I expect from the party? Sometimes it's not a whole lot. Sometimes it is significant. It, it often depends on the uh, importance of the seat to the party as a whole. What is the availability of political resources, such as uh, campaign workers, volunteers, uh, skills and money, what kind of group support will be available, those are the kinds of things they look at. And then what is the nature of the electorate? So candidates are going to ask themselves, um, how do the voters evaluate the candidates and make their decisions? You know, the particular type of voters that I am targeting, what kind of styles and tactics should I use? What is their turnout and voting record? Um, so there's these are very different things and that's what we're going to take a look at in the chapter four of the book and briefly here in this micro lecture. The candidate decision calculus, we talked a little bit about that last week, so I don't want to belabor this. These are the things we've already basically discussed, but these are personal considerations the candidates got to think about when they even decide whether or not to run. You know, how much of my privacy do I want to give up? That's a big one always. But then the candidate has to ask himself, and this is, um, um, a lot more what we're focusing on this week. Um, can I win? And, and so what is the partisan composition of the district? And how has that district voted in past elections? So you have to ask yourself this. If you're a Democrat running in a predominantly Republican seat, uh, um, in a district that has not voted or put a Democrat in that seat in 30 years, your chances of winning are probably not as good. And that goes to the heart of are these races usually competitive? Uh, certainly not. In the, the fourth district that I live in, in Colorado, before it was redistricted, uh, into the second district, uh, the fourth district of Colorado has always been very conservative and has always sent Republicans to the U.S. Congress with the exception of one year in 2008. They elected a Democrat who was promptly voted out of office in 2010. 
Um, they're going to ask themselves if I've been able to raise money in the past, in any of my past political experience, and what's my money-raising capability and my fundraising capability going to be, and are there any national issues that might affect my chances of winning? Certainly quite a few Democrats lost their seats in the 2010 midterm elections because of the health care reform issue and a number of other things. It felt like Obama was a big spender. Uh, there were a number of issues on the national scene that cost a lot of them their seat. Again, how much can the party organization provide and this kind of stuff. So these are the kinds of things they look at. As your book points out, there are very different strategies in the Senate versus the House, because if you're running for the Senate, you're, you're running for an entire state. This is usually a larger, much more diverse electorate. You, you take a state like California, and you have everything from rural farmland to heavily urban populated areas to the people over on the eastern side of uh, California that live in the Sierra Nevadas and the mountains and the rural areas. So in this sense, you're going to have to tailor your message to a more diverse public, meaning you're probably going to be more generic in your stands on issues. And you've also got to find a way to reach them in the media and get your name recognition up. You're going to have to raise a lot more money, and you will need a much larger campaign staff. For a House seat, it's usually a smaller electorate. The diversity is usually um, not as great, but it would depend on the district. You may have a district that's totally split with uh, urban and rural. That's what the 4th District of Colorado used to look like. A large chunk of it was eastern rural plains of northeastern Colorado. Actually, the part you may have heard that is looking to secede from the rest of the state. <laughs> and the other chunk of the 4th District was um, the city of Fort Collins and Loveland uh, and Greeley, uh, heavily urban areas. In the last redistricting in the state, the uh, Fort Collins, Loveland area were sliced off of the 4th District, put in the second district with Boulder. So there you have it. Well, nothing more needs to be said there. <laughs> so your method of communication, if you're running for the House, is going to be more mass mailings, flyers, one-on-one -on -one contact, community meetings, that kind of stuff, as your book talks about. So you're, you're not going to need quite as much money, but it's still very expensive. We'll be looking more at what some of these races cost. The key candidate resources are party organization, interest groups, media, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that's most precious to a candidate is time. But, you know, the candidate cannot personally visit all voters, especially if they're running for the Senate. Uh, someone running a small district might be able to do that. So they're going to have to rely on all these other things. Uh, the party organization, which is key sometimes in helping to get out the vote on election day. Party organization can also provide survey research and other kinds of polling resources. Uh, the national parties may funnel resources down into these elections at the state level to try to influence them and help them out. Um, organized groups. These can be used as a resource. However, you have to be careful. You have some groups that can actually generate a good deal of support for a candidate, or they can create a great deal of opposition for a candidate. So let's say your candidate in the Sierra Club comes out with an ad in support of you. This is going to alienate maybe some, uh, you know, hunters and other people like that who wouldn't want to vote for you. Or they might tag you as being definitely one of those, uh, you know, Birkenstock, granola crunching, sprout eating, uh, Berkeley hippies. There you go. That's, that's a joke. Um, but anyway, if you, you have to be careful what types of groups you affiliate with. This is what makes the election mix today so much more volatile and so much more interesting because now we have all these super PACs coming into the race, running ads in support of or against in opposition to a particular candidate, and nobody really knows what they're all about. You know, we'll talk about that more when we talk about these super PACs. Uh, groups like the Sierra Club, the National Rifle Association, AARP, you have very clear identities with them, and they also typically tend to identify with particular political parties, so that helps you uh, understand a little bit more about what that candidate is um, what, the, what that candidate is all about, if they're supported by the Sierra Club versus being supported by the National Rifle Association. Uh, but when you get these super PACs like Restore Our Future, what does that name tell you? It tells you very little. And unless you dig and dig and find out who is funding that, you really have no clue. 
So this is the new role that these interest groups are playing. The media, we're going to talk about an awful lot next week. We're going to talk about the role of the media, the role of the news broadcasting system, the political pundits, the journalists. Um, what is the impact of political advertising on voter decision making? How does that influence it? So we'll talk more about that. But And then, of course, the personal campaign organization is incredibly important. The um, candidate is going to have to take a look at where are all my available resources and how do I want to target each of these little piles of resources? What am I going to do with them? So these are things that have to be considered. Now we turn our attention for just a moment to who votes. This is something that is discussed in great detail in Chapter 4, and I'm just going to touch on it lightly. We know and we've always known through 50, 60 years of studies that those higher socioeconomic status folks are the ones who vote in higher numbers as a percentage of their portion of the population. So uh, upper middle class people, middle class, wealthy folk, these folks are going to have a higher turnout. Typically we see older people vote. As your book points out, uh, young people um, in terms of the percentage of the population that they represent, they vote in some of the smallest numbers. Um, so they're, you know, they, they just your book talks about the reasons behind that. People who have a high degree of interest in politics, like all of you out there taking this class, probably voters. People who have a high sense of civic duty. And of course it goes without saying you're partly loyalists and activists are going to vote. But you've also got certain demographic groups that vote in higher numbers that I haven't gone into here. You've got um, or I mean vote in lower numbers. I'm sorry, not higher numbers. You have your African Americans who vote as a percentage of their portion of the population vote in very small numbers. Um, Latinos uh, in some areas of the country vote in small numbers. It's hard to get out the uh, Hispanic vote. So you have to keep all these things in mind if you're a candidate. You know, what, what is my target population here, my target constituency, and how hard is it going to be to get them out to vote? What is it going to take? That affects your campaign organization, so you start looking at all this kind of stuff. One thing in terms of how voters decide I wanted to point out to you that you need to remember. This is for those of you who are engineer minded and like uh, schematic diagrams. I like trying to, um, oh, how do I put it? I like, I like trying to draw diagrams of politics. And I didn't come up with this one. Someone else did a long time ago. But nonetheless, how do voters decide? What are the things that influence their decisions? You can come over here and look. And, and what this basically is is our political socialization that you already know about from your other political science classes that you've taken. You know, we form our attitudes early in life from our family, education, friends, spouse. All this stuff helps make up our partisan identification. You know, here we are, the voter now. We got a whole background of this stuff that's sort of got us already tilting for the most part to a conservative position or a liberal position. So this generally translates into our party identification. I want to keep that in mind. This is a long-term force in the election process. Something by that we mean it does not change from election to election. Typically the party registration in this country uh, in terms of percentage of Democrats, percentage of registered Republicans, and percentage of independents does not change from election to election. You may have sweeping realignments as we did after the New Deal and after the Civil War, but party identification of the average person doesn't change. So that's a long-term force that you can kind of count on for a while. Now the voter is going to take a look at these things, the image of the candidate, the issues presented, and they're going to think about those by running them through this little filter that they have here. They're going to be considering these, aha, uh -huh, but they'll consider them through the filter of whether they're Republican or Democrat. So Democrats and Republicans are going to evaluate issues differently. Many, many Democrats love the health care reform bill. Many Republicans hate it. It's the same bill. It's just the way they look at it and view it. So we take a look at image and issues, and they're what we call short-term forces. These things do change from election to election. Even in two years, they can change. In four-year term, they can change. Um, look how the issues in the political landscape change so significantly from 2008 to the 2010 midterm elections. 
So these are all the things that the voters are going to consider when they're trying to make their voting decision. And they can just go directly to the image and the issues and think about it. They can run this through their party ID filter and evaluate them in the context of, am I a conservative or a liberal? Nonetheless, what happens is out comes their voting decision. They can also shortcut this entire thing and not even fool with image and issues and rely solely on the party identification of the candidate to cast their vote. So I just want you to remember this. This should give you a visual of, of how people are making their decision, and your book massages that a lot more. So money and media in elections, we're going to focus on a lot more next week. I do have something embedded for you to look at or to listen to, Citizens United v. the FEC, an interview with John McCain and, and Russ Feingold, two of the authors of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act uh, that was at the heart of Citizens United and the subsequent rise of the super PACs. So you've got some stuff to listen to and look at for this week, but we're going to spend most of the time discussing this next week. Um, this is going to be a, a hot topic next week. Campaign commercials, what do they do for us? Do they open inform us? Do they mislead us? Where are we going with all this? What is the role of money in our elections? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? And what about these super PACs? Who are they? Where did they come from? And are they good? So stay tuned for next week.